to get started here. So this is the Center for Climate Science and Engineering October 2021 guest lecture event, and it's featuring Dr. Anna Roback. And before we get started, I would like to give a quick land acknowledgement. Uh, so we wish to acknowledge uh, this land on which the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. Today, this meeting place is still the home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. And after uh, attending some, you know, becoming more aware of some of the Indigenous um, you know, ways. Uh, I've, I've heard that it's uh, appreciated to give a little bit of a personal acknowledgement uh, when giving a land acknowledgement. And from my experience, uh, being on this land has allowed me to, you know, begin what I think is a successful career. And uh, that is what being on this land means to me. And I've, I've heard that that's uh, giving a personal perspective is an important aspect of a land acknowledgement. So I want to, to add that part in there too. So now let's get started uh, with the presentation. So a quick about us for those who don't know, uh, the CSE or the Center for Climate Science and Engineering is a research and education center and it's housed within the Civil and Mineral Engineering Department at U of T and it was established back in 2019. So it's a group of multidisciplinary faculty. So shown on this slide over here, we have uh, the center director is Oya Merkan. She focuses on structural analysis and then there's uh, six other faculty members. So Marion Hotspalu focusing on transportation, Paul Kushner uh, from physics who focuses on climate dynamics, Graham Norvell from chemical engineering focuses on health and process safety, Daniel Posen from civil engineering focusing on life cycle assessment, Karen Smith uh, from U of T in Scarborough focusing on atmospheric science and Mary Ann Tucci who focuses on building science who also is in civil engineering and also mechanical engineering. Uh, and then there's me, my name's Jamie Fine, and I am the center manager. I'm also a postdoc in the civil engineering department. So as I said before, the CSE is a multidisciplinary center, uh, but what are the main activities that we try to do? So in short, we really focus on education. So developing uh, online learning modules, uh, developing some courses, graduate level courses. Uh, that's the education component. We also focus on research, so carrying out uh, research that's at the intersection between climate science and engineering, and that really allows for understanding how engineering, um, you know, engineered systems are going to be impacted by the change in climate, which is hopefully of interest to everybody here, considering that you came to a talk that's going to be just about that. And then on top of that, uh, we do outreach. So, for example, these guest lectures. That's what the little megaphone is. Is trying to get the word out. You know. Engineering is impacted by climate science and vice versa, that the engineered environment impacts our climate. And it's important to consider the interactions. Uh, a couple other announcements before we get started. Uh, number one, as I said, we focus on education. So we have some new online learning modules that we're creating as part of a project that the CSE is uh, that is working on. And we're going to begin pilot testing this within the next few weeks. So if you're a U of T student and you're interested in being a pilot tester of these e-learning modules, uh, we're looking to recruit some more pilot testing students. And please contact me at this email listed on the slide here, at cse.sivmin at utoronto.ca. Uh, please feel free to email me if you're interested in being a pilot tester. It's just, um, you know, it's a pretty low commitment. It would be a volunteer commitment, but a pretty low number of hours you need to spend on it. And I think it would be interesting uh, to be involved. It's, uh, they're turning it to be some rather interesting learning modules. Uh, and you can also email me there if you have any questions. Okay, I'll leave that for one more second to make sure if you want to write down that email address. Okay. Uh, now moving on, so as I said, we do education. We also do a bunch of outreach. So these guest lectures, I just wanna announce our next guest lecture. So the next guest lecture is gonna be given by John Voss, who's a professional engineer, who's also the principal of uh, Jupiter Energy Advisors Incorporated. He's going to be speaking about uh, dysfunctional assumptions on the energy transition pathway. And what that really is going to be about is uh, businesses are beginning to transition for being on fossil fuels. And in doing that, there are economic impacts on your business. And he's going to talk about 
key assumptions that are going to lead to successful economic outcomes while your business makes that transition and how to consider that. So if you want to attend that guest lecture, that's in about one month from today. It's on November 17th at 5 p.m. Going to be on Zoom again. Uh, if you're interested in remaining up to date, you can go to our website, www.uoftcse.ca, get on our mailing list, or if you registered for this event, you'll get emailed that, about that event too, and registration is going to open up in the next few days, hopefully in an easier way than the Eventbrite, uh, you know, the Eventbrite account that needs to be made. So if you're interested in coming, that's the next, next guest lecture. And, and that's it for housekeeping from me. So now just the last component here is introducing our very, uh, very special invited guest, uh, Dr. Anna Roback, who is a professional engineer. She's also the Director of Research and Innovation at WSP Canada. And just a quick introduction is, um, so Dr. Anna Roback leads research and innovation at WSP Canada, where she advises engineers, scientists, and planners on planning and implementing research and innovation and fosters collaboration across the business and with academia and industry. Anna's technical expertise is in modeling and decision-making for infrastructure assets. And she takes a particular interest in both the human side of the, of the built environment and the less built alternatives to traditional infrastructure. So that's it, that's my introduction. And I hope, uh, hope it went okay for you there, Anna. And I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. And now I can actually see you, so that's good. And uh, please share your screen. And I'm really looking forward to your presentation. All right, perfect. And just to check on time, I have until the hour, or do we want to leave some time for questions and discussion? I think leaving leaving a few minutes for questions and discussion is uh, is going to be good. Okay. And I think you're going to have to enable screen sharing for oh, me. Let's see here. Okay. So panelists and uh, more. Allow chat, make host, change role to attendee. Are you sure you can't share your screen? Yeah, it says host disabled oh, participants. Oh, there we go. How, how about now? Yeah, looks like I might be able to do this. OK. Perfect. You got it? Oh, yeah. It's perfect. Okay. Well, thank you very much for having me. I am absolutely thrilled to be here to talk to you about a topic actually that hasn't had as much research as you would have thought. Um, you, you will have seen some, some research on the climate change impacts on materials, maybe even on the life cycle of assets, but that extra step further of understanding the cost implications, the total cost of asset ownership, um, and of course, the role of health, which is another little tidbit that I'm, I'm very passionate about. So one thing that I, over the past couple of years, I've been doing a bit of research in this space. And most recently, some colleagues of mine from WSP have done a really fascinating piece for the Financial Accountability Office of Ontario. That report will give you a whole lot more information, some really good meaty bits to get into about the asset life cycle cost implications of climate change, increasing heat, increasing precipitation, and increasing freeze thaw cycles. That will be coming out just ahead of the COP26, uh, so in less than two weeks, and it will be on their website. I actually I just checked it right before, and it's still not up. I, I'm so excited for this to come up. But I'll tell you a little bit more about the research. I can't give you the, the actual meat of it or the outcomes yet, but I can tell you a little bit about the, the methodology because it's really interesting. So, you know, I said that there's not been a lot of work done on cost of asset ownership and climate change. The thing is, asset owners historically have really just looked at, well, what is our cost buildup? How are our assets going to change in terms of performance over time? but really mostly based on age and expected changes in condition. They are starting to get more into climate change and you know, looking at what assets they might need to add or strengthen to their portfolio, but they really haven't come to that very holistic place yet where climate change is a real embedded consideration in the way they manage their assets and plan their assets into the future. So in this talk today, I have a bit of a proposal to change the way we plan and budget for assets. 
uh, this is exciting for me as someone with a background in asset management. I hope everybody is as excited about this as I am. And in the spirit of advancing knowledge, since this is what your center is all about, advancing knowledge and uh, learning more, inquiring, I would ask to, I'll share two things of you. One is a bit more about that FAO report. And the second is please, as I go along, share any resources that you're aware of that fit into the topic of this in the chat. If there's things that I say and you know something more recent, please add it. Uh, I think it would be wonderful if we all had a whole bunch of resources at the end of this to, you know, to lean on and, and to build on. That's all to say that if you are a researcher who is thinking about going into this space, there is so much opportunity for you right now to really to investigate what the implications are, but also to make a change, make a difference to the way asset owners are, are planning for their assets and, and realizing how much of an impact is coming up for them. So the journey I'm going to take you on over this next little bit, I'll give you a bit of a primer on life cycle costing, how that works uh, in the traditional asset management world and a few extra thoughts that start to dig deeper that will give you a hint of why climate change is so important. Uh, a little bit about the role of climate change in life cycle costs, the role of health in, in those life cycle costs, and then finally, how we can actually reduce those costs. Now, when I talk about reducing the cost, I won't be necessarily talking about reducing the effects of climate change. There's other ways that I'll be, uh, that I'll be looking into. And finally, offering you a proposal for, for starting to change this current paradigm. So let me start with the primer. And I, I guess the other thing to say is as I go, if there are questions, please feel free to add them into the chat. And since I, I don't have that uh, I can see the chat on the side. So yeah, if, if I notice something come up, then I'll answer it. Uh, and otherwise maybe Jamie can nudge me or we can save it till the end. I'll, I'll let Jamie make that judgment. So you may have heard of an infrastructure deficit. And I just wanna be clear that it is not just one thing. There's not only one way of estimating what is our deficit in Canada, for example. Here, is a smattering of ways that infrastructure deficit has been estimated by different organizations. So you can see here that our infrastructure deficit has been estimated in the hundreds of billions of dollars by everyone who's looked at it so far. The four main organizations that have made publications uh, are the Canadian Chamber of Commerce. They have some pretty big estimates of between 50 billion and 570 billion as an infrastructure deficit. The Canada West Foundation between 123 billion and 238. And a little bit of context here, the 123 billion is just to make good the set of assets we already have. Whereas this extra bit for the Canada West Foundation was how much more do we need that we don't yet have? Then there's 145 billion estimate from CCPA and FCM has also done an estimate of $123 billion. Now, if you're wondering why are these so different, there are all kinds of ways of estimating this. What we, I'm gonna show you now is the most basic starting point. It is what you will have seen if you have seen Canada's infrastructure report card, which looks a little something like this. So in the report card, this tells you the percentage of the asset stock in terms of value that is considered to be very poor. This is the pink one at the bottom. And it just occurs to me if you're colorblind, I'll just I'll try to show you where these areas are. The percentage that's poor, that's fair, that is good, et cetera. And you can see that for all the different asset classes, all the core asset classes, uh, that public infrastructure owners own. Now, typically what we do is to, in, in this kind of instance, is to use this information and say, hmm, if we wanna get everything up to good, but everything is not in good condition right now, what percentage of our asset base is not yet good? And what would it cost to upgrade them to be good? So as I explained that, you might already see some flaws in the way an infrastructure deficit is calculated. It actually makes sense to have some of your asset base in a lower condition. It depends on your management strategy, but it may well be that your strategy is to have 
a certain amount in a very poor condition because you're going to keep renewing the asset. You have to let it to get to a certain point or you might choose to let to it get to a certain point before you actually invest in that renewal. So then once you know the condition and when you, once you take that estimate, there's another layer of of sophistication that we can take to this. Again, this is very basic stuff in the asset management world. I just realized I was hovering over the wrong screen as I was talking. So uh, when we look at how long an asset lasts, this is what you'll be looking at. So we tend to look at what is the condition of our asset. Here, the condition is represented in a zero to one kind of way where one or 0.8 in this case is excellent condition, it's brand new. And over time, your asset degrades in terms of condition and you expect that to happen. Now, when we think about what, how much we need to invest in this asset over time, we look at this, this threshold here is called the repair threshold. So it means once my asset gets to this below this point, it's no longer worth repairing it. I have to do something a bit more serious to it. And so how much will it cost if I actually repair it before then? And, and then if I do repair it, does it come back all the way to this original condition? And if so, does it follow the same trajectory? So you can imagine that we can we have a look at how many times can I keep repairing this thing? How much can it push the life out? And what is the cost every time I make that repair? Alternatively, you can let it get all the way down to this failure threshold where you actually let the asset fail. And there are lots of reasons you might choose to do that. And then once it fails, you might need to replace the entire thing. And you can see what kind of a cost implication that is. I realize that I'm, I'm showing what the cost implication is by pushing up this line for condition, but please accept that as the same kind of thing where if you're bringing the condition up to a certain level, there's a, a bigger cost. And, and the more you're bringing up that condition, the bigger the cost is. And so this is the game that asset managers play to try to find that optimal point. Is it where along this line do you make the repair or replacement? How big is it? How many times do you do it? And so that's why I say it, you know, the way that the infrastructure deficit is often calculated is not necessarily accurate to the way that asset managers manage their, their asset stock, because it may well be that they have a strategy to, some, to let some of it get all the way down to this, this low threshold. So when we model asset life and oh, uh, when we model Anna, there's this there's a quick question I think in the chat that might be interesting oh, yeah. to answer. Uh, it sure. says, do you evaluate the repair point for individual assets or broad asset groups? Um, okay, so what we tend to do is take a group of assets where we might say this is a very critical asset type. Um, this is a less critical asset type. I, there's, there's, there tends to be more, more in between that as well. But for the more critical ones, you might choose to just keep that operating and, and repair it more often. With the less critical ones, you might choose a strategy where you actually wait until it fails. Um, so right, when we're modeling asset life and maintenance costs, we do sometimes consider things like precipitation, drainage, some high level climate factors but we really don't get into the detail of what we expect to happen into the future. So when I say we consider precipitation, what I really mean is we look at what is the general moisture content of the ground or of the soil that is supporting this asset. Um, we might do some sensitivity analysis, but really that does not happen very often. Um, so they're super high level. Now, I did mention that when our WSP's team started doing this work, they did not find a lot of research at all on the cost implications of climate change. I had wondered when I did the search myself if perhaps this was just hidden somewhere. Um, and it, it seems that that is not the case. There, there's very little out there. So this is a, a place where I would say, please, if you know about anything, just pop into the chat box. I'll be very interested to hear about it. So let me dig a little bit deeper now into what makes up these costs. The life cycle of an asset starts with identifying the need for this asset. So as an example, 
properties are flooding. We have to do something about it. Maybe it means move to the plan stage. Maybe it means we um, increase the pipe size of our stormwater system. And then you move into the design stage, which is, well, exactly how big does this pipe need to be? How does the rest of the network need to be changed along with it? And then you move on to the construction and commissioning piece. And this is where you get the materials and equipment, you prepare the site, you manage traffic, you do the building, you then disestablish. Uh, and when I talk about commissioning specifically, this is more relevant to say buildings and water and wastewater, you might test valves and test systems and make sure the alarm systems are working correctly. That you know uh, that when a water level gets to a certain level that you will get alarm instead of things overflowing. Then when we move to the operation and maintenance stage, this is where you might have regular cleaning of your reservoir pipes. You might do structural inspections, respond to alarms, test water quality, um, power, uh, lighting, all that kind of stuff that you're looking out for. Uh, and then when we get to the decommissioning stage, this is where you're planning to minimize disruption really. So are you going to reuse the materials? Where do the materials go? How do you make sure that traffic isn't unduly impacted? And so, um, so typically an asset owner simply looks at their historic unit costs for each of these stages, inflates them to account for increasing unit costs. Um, and really they just use the same practices they've always used. What you will notice here is one of the things that is missing from my diagram is uh, the people. <laughs> uh, so we actually build assets for people and part of that comes in here in the need, but I just am raising that now because as we talk about the cost implications, I am not initially gonna talk a lot about the impacts on people and that is a huge component. So just to give you a sense of the different components that make up our life cycle costs from an asset owner's perspective, we first have the labor component. So at each stage of this, people are doing, you know, people are doing the work. And then we have the materials and equipment. And that's mostly in the construction and commissioning, operation and maintaining the, the latter part of the life cycle here. And then we have insurance costs. And the reason I raised that one is typically I probably wouldn't insurance and permits and that sort of thing. But with climate change, it is becoming so much more of a volatile uh, and unpredictable thing. And finally, we have time. So the more time any of this takes, the bigger the cost typically. So I wanna give you a sense now of the scale of the labor component here because we tend to think about the cost of doing work to assets and we think of all these big machines, uh, but actually there's a big people part too. This one I'm showing you now, I apologize, I don't have the reference here. I, um, it was a colleague of mine from Australia who, when she worked for the public works in Adelaide, she was asked to develop an understanding of what proportion of in asset investments stayed local versus which ones went external, so overseas, uh, overseas or just further abroad. And she actually categorized asset works into three, new works, new capital. She looked at renewals, so that would mean that, you know, you're basically just refreshing something, maybe replacing it, and maintenance, and, you know, that's where you're just checking things a lot of the time and repairing things and responding. So what she found that with new works, about 50% of the cost of that asset went into labor. So local people for the most part. And she found that the other 50% went was outsourced work, materials and profits. When she looked at renewals, she found that a bigger percentage actually stayed within the community that they lived in. And a smaller proportion went outside. And finally, with the maintenance part, you can see 80% of the maintenance work was actually labor. So it was all people work with a small percentage going outside. And for a bit of perspective, one more lens on this, here's how the activities are distributed in both cost and time. Uh, 
and cost. So when you look at the asset lifecycle stages, there's a pretty big variation in construction versus operation and maintenance. But overall, people have found that the construction and commissioning part makes up about a third to a half of the cost of an asset throughout its entire life cycle. And the operation and maintenance takes up much, much of the rest of it. And so when we think about the costs, uh, there tends to be very little emphasis on the operations and maintenance phase because typically when politicians or other decision makers are looking at the cost of this asset, they're looking at what does it cost to build the thing. And then unfortunately, uh, there is not a, an attached policy in place that says, oh, when you said you would build this, you also said you would add to our operations and maintenance budget. So this, uh, this new asset is typically just handed over to another department and uh, not much budget comes with it. The other aspect that's a little bit different of these life cycle costing is the time. So again, the operations and maintenance part of your asset management takes up a huge proportion of the life cycle. It makes a lot of sense, right? Uh, you're going to be operating and maintaining this asset for a very long time. But the reason I drew these to your attention, you're going, okay, this is very obvious stuff, is because as I'm doing this, I'm hoping that you're starting to see why both climate change and health can have such a huge impact on the cost of our assets into the future. So, let me get into a little bit more of that. How does climate change actually come into this? This is where I get to say a little bit more about the very exciting work that my colleagues have done for FAO. This chart is taken from their report, from their draft report. And what you can see here, I showed you this graph earlier, but this white line is the essence of the work that they did. The big question was how much with climate change, with extreme heat, extreme precipitation and freeze thaw cycles changing, how much does this line shift to the left? How much shorter will the asset life be? And therefore, what is the implication for the cost of our assets into the future? Um, I'm, I'm just I'm so excited for you to see what the results are. Um, so I did say that when our team started this work, they found very little research. The reason what they did find though was some very site specific analysis of the impact of climate change on costs in a way that just wasn't transferable to other research or you know it'd be a great starting point that other people could use maybe, but it just wasn't there yet. Uh, and so in, of course, is, is your opportunity. Now, let me share what the table, one of the tables looks like without the data in it, but sorry, it'll, it'll get you kind of wet your appetite, I hope, for what you will be seeing. Here you have the climate hazard. So the three main ones that they looked at, extreme heat, rain, and freeze thaw cycles. And then the percentage of climate variation that was expected over the life of these assets. And by the way, this was done for all of Ontario um, over their entire asset, public asset stock. So it's huge. And then what they did was to say, what is the change to the useful service life, USL? And the way that they looked at the service life was in two ways. One was, will this thing be so deteriorated it can't function? And the other was, do we actually have to replace this thing at some stage because it, it doesn't serve the same function it used to? So do we have to expand, um, increase the capacity of our stormwater network, for example? And so for the useful service life, they used uh, pessimistic, most likely an optimistic. Uh, and here's where I get into the really neat part. And the reason why there's so much potential, so much more potential for you to do research is that this was based on the Delphi method. So this was based on interviewing people out in industry, asking their opinions on what they thought the pessimistic, most likely and optimistic outcomes of these climate change uh, indicators would be on each of the asset groups. So you'll see uh, the table is massive. It has roads and all the roads components. It has structures and you know the building envelope, the building structure itself. 
So it's a really fascinating table uh, that you will just be very, if you're into this kind of thing, you'll be very excited to have a look at what the numbers actually say. Uh, and you can start to have a look. Some of them, I can just tell you, there are changes of 50% and above. So it's some pretty massive changes there. Now, I want to take a step outside of this to some extent. Uh, I want to take a step back and I want to share with you what I consider to be the three dimensions in which climate will be changing and, and increasing our costs. I'm going to call it the bitter pill uh, because it's shaped like a pill. What you can see here is that climate change will increase the replacement frequency of our assets. So their expected life will decrease, which means we'll have to replace them more often. It will increase the quantum of assets that we will need. So that could mean that we need bigger pipes. It could mean that we need wider roads, although that doesn't really fit with climate change. Um, but you kind of get the idea of how we might need more, more of something, more insulation, for example, for, for electrical cables, for our buildings. And then it will increase the unit costs. And this is actually one that I've seen a very, even less research on than all of the rest of them. And it's one that the FAO report that you'll see does not incorporate in any kind of a direct way. So again, so much more capacity for you to have a look. And I will get into each one of those. Uh, and I'll start with heat and how heat, increasing heat plays out. So increasing heat will shorten the life of our assets through material deterioration. Uh, you know, pavements in particular will virtually melt under more extreme heat. Through disaster, forest fires, for example, uh, again, they might just, it might be a, a sudden disaster uh, that just breaks, <laughs> that breaks the asset itself or that completely destroys the asset as opposed to deteriorating over time. And it will increase the demand for assets through things like, hey, I need more physical protection. When I go outside, I want more shade. So build me some more shade structures. Uh, when I'm inside, I need more protection. So I need more air conditioning or more insulation into my buildings. It can also increase demand through a need for conservation and treatment. And while this isn't particularly relevant to buildings or roads, I wanted to share it with you because there might be some parallels. In the water, uh, in potable water, for example, our fresh water resources will have more cyanobacteria because of increasing heat. So that means we will have to treat them more and that's a lot more infrastructure and it's expensive infrastructure. And then we get into the unit costs. So the unit costs will increase through things like an increasing cost of wood due to forest fires, uh, due to threats from invasive species, and also the cost of labor. Now, I will give you a little bit more on that, but first I wanna to turn to flooding uh, before we get into health, the health piece. So flooding will shorten the life of our assets, again, through material de deterioration, uh, through disasters. So an estimate by the Insurance Bureau of Canada brought that impact up to about $12 billion. Flooding will increase demand through, say, the need to strengthen um, strengthen roads, strengthen assets, keep them in place if there are floods, maybe have them floating, and the need to increase capacity of our stormwater systems, for example. It will also increase the unit cost through cost of materials, supply chain, raw material production disruption, and the cost of land. As we disallow people to be building in flood prone, prone, air, prone areas, uh, the cost of land will increase for the land that is available. And then the cost of insurance and the cost of protecting our construction sites. As flooding becomes less predictable and more prevalent, um, construction sites will be insured for more and more so that while they are building, everything is not destroyed or, or if it is, uh, they are paying high insurance costs for it. And again, we have the implication of the cost of labor increasing and how does health play into all of this? So there are two main ways that I'll show that health plays into life cycle costs. One is uh, in, in, in oh, Anna, yeah. we have we, we got two two questions I've seen before you start the next section there. Yeah. Uh, the first one is from Daniel Posen, which says, 
most of the discussion so far seems to assume only negative consequences, especially <laughs> in cooler climates like in Canada. Are there not benefits to associated example with milder winters? Um, in terms of asset life cycle costs, they are fairly minor, unfortunately. So you're right, recognizing the free freeze thaw cycles will be reducing in some areas. Um, but that impact certainly has not had the kind that we we're expecting. Um, outside of that, you're absolutely right. There's all kinds of other benefits that we can expect to see. But in terms of the life cycle costs, not that I found so far, which is not to say there couldn't be, but um, not in what I found. All right, excellent, thank you. And then the other question is from Iveta Demarova. Uh, who says, is the cost of labor rising proportionally or disproportionately to other types of unit costs? Mm. Um, so the unit costs themselves will be increasing, I am going to say more than um, the cost of other regular goods and services. But let me walk you through the labor piece here and, and the impacts, and you can start to see how, although I'm putting this in the context of life cycle increases, because I think that's a really good point, um, it will affect all kinds of other costs as well. So let me walk you through that. When we look at health and health-based infrastructure demand, and I'm afraid, Daniel, to your question, there's more negative coming, but it will come around. Um, so when we look at health and, sorry, heat and its impact on infrastructure demand, we will see a decrease in physical activity. Fewer people will want to go outside, uh, which will mean an increase in vehicle use. And uh, it also means an increase in hospital demand because we do have rising rates of heart disease, of cancer, uh, and those particular diseases and other chronic diseases do have a significant part that is attributable to physical activity. And then you'll see an, an increase in demand for indoor activity spaces, production, protection outdoors, uh, and I mentioned the water treatment and volume as well, of course. And then in terms of the cost of labor, so this is the part that really caught my attention. Again, this, this particular piece of work was done by a colleague of mine, I think it came out of his PhD, where he had to look at worker productivity, particularly in the AEC ind industries in mining, agriculture, uh, and engineering. And he found that exposure to excessive heat itself would have an impact of about $3.5 billion. I have the references there. Know that the reference is based on an expected amount of CO2 emissions, and it's also tied to GDP. So there's a couple of linkages to make there, um, but I'm sure he or I would be really happy to explain how we came about there. Now, on top of that, we will have an increase in heat-related illness, which means more people taking more leave from their jobs. And the impact of that, the heat-related illness itself, is in the order of $3 billion. And I, I'll apologize for making these absolute numbers. As you know, they are ranges, uh, but these are the estimates that were done. And again, with an increase, uh, sorry, decrease in physical activity, increase in chronic disease, increase in people taking leave. Now, what I wish I could do is convert this into some kind of a, and that means the unit cost will increase by this much, but I, I can't do that at this stage. Um, and back to Eva's question about, you know, relative to other, other industries, how will this be different? The heat one in particular, there is an additional impact on engineering industry because they are the ones, or that's one of the industries where people are actually working outside. So there's gonna be more of an impact there. And finally, this other little tidbit, right now about 25% of Canadians are caregivers to aging, for, to older adults, uh, to family members with disabilities. And if we assume that only the number, the percentage of caregivers increases relative to the number of the percentage of older adults, then 37% of, of Canadians will be caregivers. And the reason that I raised that one in the context of, of increasing heat and the cost of labor is that with increasing heat, there will be more people to look after. So really for flooding, it's a little bit different, but you kind of can see the formula here. 
the cost of mental health, this part is not related to flooding, by the way, the cost of mental health is expected to more than double by 2030 to about $150 billion. And a really neat, very recent piece of research done by, again, a former colleague who is at Uranus found that the mental health impacts are three to four times higher for people afflict, affected by floods uh, than people not. And also a 10% increase in absenteeism. So these particular ones will probably be industry-wide as opposed to more specific to the engineering industry. But again, you can see the, the magnitude of impacts here. Now, finally, I'll get out of the negative and into a little bit more positive and consider what can we actually do about this? What are some of the smaller smart alternatives? And when I talk about smart, I'm talking not just about technology, but also about green infrastructure, behavioral change, um, and a really broad context here. So just looking at my bitter pill, uh, if we address each of the parts of the ways in which the cost of our assets will increase, the asset quantum will increase because of, uh, sorry, the asset quantum will increase and there's things that we can do about that. So behavior wise, we can put demand management practices in place. We can use technology in fact, we can use technology to enhance those demand, the effectiveness of those demand management approaches. We can use green infrastructure. Uh, there's actually been a good amount of, of work done on green infrastructure and its capacity to do the same or better in some instances than traditional infrastructure. And then we can use community institutions as well to share the type of asset. So really um, getting different organizations to come together and multi make a multi-purpose sort of asset. Then the second dimension of replace, replacement frequency, one of the things we can do here is use, using technology to more accurately predict performance. And we've seen this kind of thing where there's a lot of safety factors built into our assets. If we can more accurately predict and understand their actual behavior, then we might be able to let them last longer, knowing that we'll have more, um, we'll actually have notice before something fails. And finally, on the unit cost side, we can use technology, especially on the construction sites and in operation and maintenance context. Uh, and again, using green infrastructure instead of traditional will we'll reduce our costs. So I'll take them one at a time and I realize we are quickly running out of time. You probably will have seen things like this before. This is a chart showing what the costs are of these different initiatives that are meant to reduce the quantum of, of traditional asset. So forest damage protection from heat, for example, there are things that can be done uh, and the benefits way outweigh the costs and in fact, way outweigh the traditional. So and this forest water waste, forest wastewater treatment one, for example, um, the costs and benefits here are really based on the benefits, the benefits being the alternative, which is the traditional wastewater treatment option. So there's all kinds of, of ways of reducing asset quantum using green infrastructure. And please understand, uh, you can't use them all the time, but it's certainly worth considering. And then in terms of reducing the cost of our assets, there are all kinds of technology this piece that I did was focused on the construction process in particular and how technology could reduce costs. But you can see things like BIM can reduce the cost of design by 5%, um, the cost of construction and commissioning by between eight and 15%. And some of the ways that that happens is simply by having a really accurate representation of something of the asset itself before it goes out to a contractor. So they have a much clearer idea of, of what it is about. So I wanna be clear that when I talk about reducing the unit costs here, using technology, this is in no way countering the effects of climate change. It is simply trying to counter the impacts of cost increases due to climate change. So what are some other ways that we can do it? Uh, and you can see that 3D printing uh, has a real potential. Now, this is only when it's a very complex structure that it can save huge costs. Uh, and real-time location systems also make sure that things uh, are brought to site on time 
uh, sort of just-in-time delivery. Uh, you know where everything is. Uh, so 10% of costs of in the entire construction process can be saved. And there is uh, an article that brings all of these together. It, it's a series called Costing the Chasm, if you wanted to check it out. And of course, you can contact me as well later. Now, how can we make sure these solutions are actually implemented? Uh, and I think we all want to do that here. So we did a little research piece a couple of years ago, interviewing people across industry saying, what do you think are the things that we really need to, to make change? Why isn't change happening? We know about all these different solutions, these ways of say reducing costs, these ways of reducing environmental impact. Why aren't we doing them? And they told us things like, well, we need a, you know, a cross industry evidence base would be really useful. Uh, we need to train people in these new uh, in these new technologies, even green infrastructure, because we don't know enough about it. Um, but the biggest one that came across is that people said they needed to perceive their role as being one of a champion. And so when we looked at people who made decisions about things they'd never had to make a decision about before, which is what the kind of thing that we're asking people to do now, the three important factors are that they have a strong awareness and understanding of, of this technology or of the situation, that they have a strong sense of responsibility, uh, and that they are talking to their friends, uh, family, and experts, and that they have an opinion about this as well. And so those things together would actually make change. When we asked people who should actually make this change, Everyone raised the fact that, <laughs> uh, a problem for my uh, animation there, everyone raised the fact that every good, excellent change they had seen was bought, brought about by one strong champion, or it started with one, one strong champion. And at the other end of the spectrum, we said, we had people saying, well, we need government. Government has to set rules and directives and policies to get, to actually make change so that organizations will. And of course, that individual sits within an organization, that champion sits within an organization, and their role must be to champion, hey, we need a policy that says we're actually going to look at this kind of stuff, and we need roles and responsibilities so that we know who is going to do it and somebody takes that responsibility. And then we need tools and templates so that people actually know how to do this. And finally, we have the, the industry as a broader thing. So the real, the real way that change can be made, according to these discussions we've had, are, are basically you. <laughs> uh, you going out to your organization, to your industry body, and finding a way to, to make sure that those policies are in there to say, look, we, we actually want to change the way we're doing this. We want to do more research looking at how climate change will impact our, our life cycle costs. And in order to do that, we need a policy and people who are responsible and the tools and templates. And so I realize I just have two minutes left. Um, so not a lot of time left for discussion, but all that to say that there's so much more scope now for, there's so much scope for researching the impacts of climate change on, on our life cycle costs. And not only for doing the research, but actually changing the way we do that. Uh, and just as a reminder that FAO report, if you want to get in contact to know more about that, then it was my colleague Jean-Philippe Martin who did that work. And I am happy to put you in touch if you like to.